When I first learned about differential and integral calculus, I started to wonder, with all these rules, can they be bent or broken? Breaking Calculus Exploring the world of fractional derivatives? Anyone studying calculus knows you start off with learning about derivatives, which are basically rates of change. Then you move on to integrals, otherwise known as antiderivatives. When studying derivatives, one takes a look at repeated differentiation in the way of things like the first and second derivative tests, as well as a Taylor series expansion. Different symbols are used in calculus to differentiate or to represent the derivative d by dx of f of x, or f prime of x, or f super prime 1 of x. The second derivative, d2 by dx squared of f of x, is equal to f double prime, and so on. And the nth derivative can be represented in many different ways, but to make things a little bit easier, we're going to use the capital D raised to the nth power to represent the nth derivative. And this is a differential operator on the function f of x. Now taking the nth derivative of a function means that you're going to compose the derivatives one at a time, n times, on the function. So you'd take the first derivative, you take the function that results in that, then take the derivative of that, and so on. So differentiation n times is a composition of differential operators. The nth derivative, a composition of n derivatives. Now, it would be nice if we could derive a formula that tells us what the nth derivative is, so that we could just plug n into that formula, and it would give us what that nth derivative is. So recall the power rule for derivatives, that the derivative of x to the kth power would be k times x to the k minus 1 power. And differentiating that a second time, we would get k times k minus 1 uh, times x to the k minus 2 power. Differentiating a third time, we'd get k times k minus 1 times k minus 2 times x to the k minus 3 power. And the coefficients of k we can rewrite as k factorial over k minus 3 factorial here times x to the k minus 3 power. So generalizing the nth derivative to x to the k power, we get k factorial over k minus n factorial times x to the k minus n power. Because of the power rule being a nice and neat simple rule, it gives us a nice formula here, and we're going to test it out. For exponentials, we know what the rule for that is. It's e to the x. And for e to the kx, if we did that n number of times, we would get k to the nth power times e to the kx. So there's a few formulas that are easy enough for us to find when trying to find the nth derivative formula. But what about something like the sine of x? Taking multiple derivatives of sine, we know that that'll alternate between sine and cosine, as well as positive and negative values. So n will depend rather if it's even or odd, and that'll tell us something about what the derivative is. So the general formula here will have to be something like a piecewise function, meaning that it's sine sometimes and cosine other times, and positive sometimes and negative other times. It'd be nice if there were just one general formula for all functions. In other words, can we just find for any f of x, the nth derivative? Recall from just before that the nth derivative of x to the k power is k factorial over k minus n factorial times x to the k minus n power. 
Well, let's try to break this formula just a little bit. In other words, let's try to find a fractional derivative. We need to let n equal a fraction and see what happens. So let's let n equal one half and explore what exactly will be the half derivative of, well, let's here just start with something simple like x squared. Now plugging in two for k, we get two factorial over two minus one half factorial times x to the two minus one half power. Or in other words, two factorial over three halves factorial x to the three half power. Well, wait a minute. What's three halves factorial? How do you find something like that? In the world of counting, this doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. But luckily, we have something that extends the factorial into other numbers, namely the gamma function. Gamma of n, which is n minus one factorial, is given by this integral from zero to infinity of t to the n minus one power e to the negative t dt. And again, this extends the factorial notation into numbers that are not whole number inputs. Perfect for finding three halves factorial. And there's a recursive relationship that says that gamma of n plus one is equal to n times gamma of n. And we'll use that to help us calculate some values. So three halves factorial would be the same thing as gamma of five halves. And by the recursive relationship, that's gonna be three halves times the gamma of three halves. And the gamma of three halves is pi, square root of pi over two, so we get three square root of pi over four. So the half derivative of x squared, putting this together with that two factorial is eight over three square root of pi times x to the three halves power. Was it what you expected? Three and a half or well, three halves, excuse me, is one and a half between powers of one and two. Now, if we compose a second half derivative to x squared, it should return the whole derivative of x squared, which is two x. So now we're gonna take our half derivative and find its half derivative and see hopefully that it comes out to be two x. We can pull the constant of eight over three radical pi out and plugging into our formula from above, we'll have to evaluate three halves factorial. And that's going to again give us a value of three pi, square root of pi over four. And that'll be divided by one factorial times x to the first power times that constant eight over three radical pi. And with cancellation, we get 2x. So it worked. So the half derivative formula for at least x to a power works out nicely. But again, we would really like a general formula for this to really be able to do this with any function. And this is the beginnings of what we call fractional calculus. Okay, so we're gonna be interested in finding the nth order fractional integral. Well, wait a minute, what do you mean integral? Thought we were doing derivatives. Well, in order to find a fractional derivative, we're gonna to have to go through the integrals. So we begin by examining repeated integration. And just like differentiation, Composing n number of integrals together can be given by an integral operator, which we'll denote here by capital I raised to the nth power of f of x. The integration operator is simply the composition of n integrals. Now, for example, if, you, or if you're familiar with any kind of multiple integral situation, you've probably done a problem with double integrals. So let me give you an example of a double integral. Here, I'm setting up the integral from zero to t of the integral of zero to x of six u du dx. 
So examining that inner integral first, we can do that. Its, it's variable is u, and when we evaluate it from 0 to x, we get 3x squared. We put that in for our new integrand and evaluate that from 0 to t with the variable dx, and we get x cubed from 0 to t, which gives us t cubed. So we can interpret this as the second antiderivative of 6x is x cubed. So that's a nice way of understanding what a double or multiple integral is doing. It's integrating from the inside out. But that can be a very tedious job when you have many integrals to do. So here I'm going to introduce you to something called Cauchy's Repeated Integration Formula. And it's going to state that our nth integral, which can be kind of denoted in a shorthand here, but really we're going to denote it in this following way. 1 over n minus 1 factorial, the integral from a to x, of x minus t to the n minus 1 power times f of t dt. Now, the little shorthand notation again is representing n composed integrals, and we'd rather not use or do n integrals. We want the formula on the right hand side because it's actually just the evaluation of a single integral and it does the job of many, but it's not always the easier integral to do. Keep that in mind. Now let's take an example, and again, we're going to work on this idea of fractional calculus. So we're instead of using n minus one factorial, we're gonna switch over to the gamma function. Gamma of n is equal to n minus one factorial. So with this particular substitution here, and so now we have one over gamma of n, the integral from a to x, x minus t to the n minus one power, f of t dt. This gets a new name. It's called the Riemann-Liouville fractional integral. And it is good for any function f of t that we can plug into it, or f of x. So let's recall that our half derivative of x squared was eight over three radical pi x to the three halves power. And that when we differentiated that a half derivative again, we were returning to 2x, which was the full derivative. So the composition of two half derivatives gave us the whole derivative. And this sort of thing should also work for our half integrals. So we want to show that taking the half integral, composing it with another half integral of 2x, will return x squared, because this is, a, after all, anti-differentiation. So first, let's start off with the definition for a half integral of 2x. Again, we can start off by looking at it in a shorter hand notation. That would be the multiple integral way. But here, it's really going to be about evaluating 1 over the gamma of 1 half. And we're going to choose a lower limit of 0 on the integral from 0 to x of x minus t to the negative 1 half power 2t dt. Okay, and the gamma of 1 half evaluates to the square root of pi. We can also pull that factor of 2 outside of that integral. And we get an integrand that's not too terrible to deal with. In fact, we'll just start with a little u substitution by letting u equal x minus t. Rearranging that, we can say t is equal to x minus u and dt is equal to negative dx. So a straight substitution, we get 2 over radical pi. The integration limits switch to x to 0, and we have a negative du in place there. So that negative du will absorb the negative and switch the limits of integration from 0 to x. And then we're going to get u to the negative 1 half power times x minus u to the positive 1 half power. And with the little, you know, rules of powers of antiderivatives by adding 1 to each power and then dividing by that number and evaluating uh, x. Uh, sorry, u from 0 to x, it all works out a little bit like this. 2 over radical pi multiplied by 2x to the 3 halves power minus 2 thirds x to the 3 halves power, or 2 over radical pi times 4 thirds 
x to the 3 halves power, which ultimately equals 8 over 3 radical pi x to the 3 halves power. So we are looking good that the antiderivative, the half integral, worked out to be the same thing as the half derivative of the same problem. But now we have to test that the composition by doing a second half integral on our first half integral will return a full integral. Now this is gonna be a little bit more challenging to do as an integral itself because the integral or the integrand is now changed to x to the 3 halves power because we can pull that constant out front. So now we have this integral with t to the 3 halves power and again we are going to try to make some kind of substitution here but what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this a little bit nicely by making it 8 over 3 pi the integral from 0 to x t to the 3 halves power over x minus t to the half power dt. A little clever trick that we're gonna do here is we're gonna factor an x out of the bottom of the denominator there by factoring out a square root of x and then rearranging what's inside that square root to match. And that's gonna give us a new integrand which we can do a substitution on and make it look a little nicer because here x right now is just a number like a constant where t here is the variable of integration. All right, so once we get it down to this form, we pull that x to the one half power outside of the integral. We can now let, let's say z equal that t over x part of our integrand. I'm playing around with that to get x dz equals dt. Our limits of integration changed from zero to x to zero to one. And we have this constant still on the outside, the integral from zero to one of z to the 3 halves power, x to the 3 halves power, x dz, over 1 minus z to the 1 half power. The x components in that integrand can be pulled outside of the integral. Looks like we're going to change that to, let's see, 8 over x to the 5 halves power over 3 pi x to the 1 half power from 0 to 1, z 3 halves power 1 over z to the 1 half power dz okay we've got that now straightened out and we can also play around with those powers of x in the front there and write that a little nicer we'll do that in a moment but next to make this integral a little bit simpler we're going to go for the trigonometric substitution of letting z equal sine squared theta and the integration limits become 0 to pi over 2. That constant in front becomes now 8x squared over 3 pi, the integral from 0 to pi over 2. And when we kind of clean up this integrand, which some things cancel nicely, we get that constant integral from 0 to pi over 2 of just 2 sine to the fourth power theta d theta. All right, and that's something we can work with. So we'll pull that 2 outside, get 16x squared over 3 pi, and that integral part that we're going to do is going to be done by another trigonometric substitution, one for sine squared. It's actually a double angle uh, substitution. So that integral of sine to the fourth is going to be done by first looking at sine to the fourth as sine squared quantity squared. All right, so let's write that down there. And sine squared inside that parenthesis is one half one minus cosine of two theta, a double angle formula, and that's going to be squared. Of course, we're gonna expand that out, and that'll give us one fourth of one minus cosine two theta squared. Again, we're gonna spend, expand that out into a polynomial, and we're gonna get this integral, which we can split up into separate integrals by the, the linearity rule of integrals. So that's gonna give us one fourth the integral of d theta, one half the integral of cosine two theta, plus one fourth the integral of cosine squared two theta. Those first two integrals are pretty easy to evaluate. First one evaluating to pi over eight. The second one actually is gonna to evaluate to zero. And the third one is gonna be one fourth times, and again, we're gonna apply this um, rule for cosine squared of two theta and write that as one half one plus cosine four theta. 
And so now we're just going to have to uh, play around with that little integral there. And that's not too much work there. We're going to get one fourth times. And again, we're going to split some of these integrals up through their linearity. And well, you'll see what I'll do here. I won't really, you know, narrate everything here. So ultimately, at the end of the day, we're going to get pi over 8 plus pi over 16, which is 3 pi over 16. And of course, now that was the integral that had that constant in front of it of 16x squared over 3 pi. And lo and behold, through cancellation, we get x squared. So the composition of two half integrals of 2x amounted to the same thing as the whole integral of 2x, which is x squared. So it really does work. Now to do a derivative, again, I said we had to go through the integral and because derivatives and integrals have a relationship of lowering and hiring their degrees in a sense, we want to preserve this quantity that the nth derivative of the nth integral of f of x is f of x because d and i are operators that are inverses of each other. So now let's consider the Riemann Louisville fractional derivative, which is not that much different from the fractional integral formula, but with a few tweaks. And those tweaks are only designed to make sure that the integral itself is not divergent, as well as that we have values for the gamma function. So you'll see it written here with some strange notation, if you're not familiar with it, that boxy looking thing with the n is called the ceiling notation. And it basically means to round up whatever n is to the nearest integer. So we'll let that thing just be the integer k. And we're gonna rewrite this formula in a little bit. So k is an integer. And that function is called the ceiling function if you're interested and it just rounds up whatever number that is. So if n is a fraction, it'll round it up to the nearest integer. Now that relationship to the way that we take the derivative of the integral, in order for everything to work here, we need to sort of work with something called an effective order, which we'll call alpha here. So alpha plus the n is going to equal that integer k. And so I know this seems a, a, a lot to t absorb here, but we're going to rewrite this fractional derivative as 1 over gamma of alpha multiplied by the integer derivative of the integral from a to x of x minus t to the alpha minus 1 power f of t dt. And again, it's so you're taking the derivative of an integral, which ultimately returns a certain type of function. But this is a little bit different than normal derivatives. This is a non-local operator, which essentially means that this thing has some kind of global memory. So that actually is affected by whatever the lower limit a happens to be chosen to be. So if you're interested in exploring this further, putting the differential fractional derivative and the integral fractional notation together with one operator is actually called the differ integral operator. And it's pretty strange. And it broke calculus for me. And I hope that this was interesting enough for you. Please hit that like, subscribe, and notification bell for more videos. And stay tuned for the next one. Oh, hey, and if you're bored, here's some challenge problems for you to try. Find the pith derivative of x to the pi power. Or, similarly, find the eth derivative of x to the e power. I hope you can figure it out. Thanks for watching.